On the 1st of March 2010, single mother, 26-year-old Monica Botello, took her six-year-old daughter and eight-year-old daughter to her ex-boyfriend, Purcell Carson's house on Glastonbury Road in Detroit. Purcell had a 10-year-old son from a prior relationship and was a father figure to Monica's two young girls, as following their breakup, they remained close friends. During the evening, Purcell called his mother at 7.58 p.m. and told her that the girls were watching TV and that Monica was over. Under an hour later, however, two men arrived at the home and the evening turned sour. Monica took her two young girls into the bathroom while the men took Purcell down to the basement. A few minutes later, they came back and took Monica down too, leaving the two girls alone. Suddenly, the girls heard gunshots coming from the basement below and the two men quickly left the property. Once they knew the coast was clear, the eight-year-old left the bathroom and rushed downstairs to the basement. Here she found her mum, Monica Botello, clinging to life, and the man she called Daddy, 26-year-old Purcell Carson, dead. Bravely, she dialed 911 at 8.50 p.m. and desperately tried to get help for her family. Killing 911 call out of the Detroit area when an eight-year-old girl tried to call for help when her mother and father were fatally shot. My mom is in the basement and um, I need an emergency and I need hello. Where at? But the eight-year-old girl doesn't know. Her father is dead. She tries to ask her mother, who is dying. The dispatcher tells the frantic girl to stop screaming and give her a location. Okay, call your mom on the phone if she's there. She's, she's almost dead, please. Okay, you, you, you need, I can't help you without you helping me. Let me see who else in the house. Detroit police are still looking for the suspect and another man that they believe was in the home at the time of the shooting. This is the tragic story behind one of the most shocking and disturbing 911 calls ever released. Emergency 911, what's the problem? Um, my mommy's in the basement and um, I need an emergency and I need, hello? Where at? Um, I'm at... And I'll go ask my mommy. Mommy, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you where we are. I'll tell you. The dispatcher impatiently and repeatedly told her if she could speak to her mother, but the young girl explained that her mum was hurt and could not talk. In a panic, the young girl also tried to find out the address of where they were, but as they were just visiting Purcell's home in Detroit, she naturally did not know it. Let me speak to your mom. No, she's, she's almost dead. Mommy, where are we at? Tell me, I got the police on the phone. Tell me. Mommy, tell me. Where are we at? Where are we at? I said, I called 911. Where are we at? Where are we at? Um, we are at. I'm outside and I'm dead. I'm dead. Let me speak to your mom. I don't know who he is. Okay, call your mom on the phone if she's there. She's, she's almost dead. Please. Okay, you, you, you need, I can't help you without you helping me. Let me see who else in the house. Nobody's else in the house. Okay, you me. need to give me an address. You need to calm down and give me an address. Yeah. I don't know where you're at. You have to give me an address. Address? Is address? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. Stop screaming. My mom is almost dead. Okay, you don't yes, know it's ma'am. Okay. I need huh? you to calm down and give me a location. Right. The dispatcher then told the girl to calm down and to get the address by going on the porch or by looking through old mail around the house. Please help me. You promise you'll help me? I'm going to help you once you help me, okay? Go on the porch. Can you open up the door? Do you see any mail? Uh, no, um, it is. I don't see it, but I'm trying to Okay, calm you. down, calm down. Okay. Is there any mail on the table or in a drawer? How old What's are that? you? How old are you? I'm eight years old. Do you see any mail on the table or any mail in the drawer? No. Do you but see any mail on your mom's dresser? My, my 
My mom doesn't live here. The dispatcher then got quite aggressive with the young girl as she tried to understand who lived in the property and why they were there. Okay, you were just screaming at your mom. Who? Okay, who okay, do you live I, with? Huh? Who do you live with? I live with my mother. Your Ma'am. mother? Yes. I'll, okay. I'll look. look on her dresser. You just said your mom don't live there. <laughs> yeah, but I'm looking. I'm looking for everything, and I can't find nothing. Please, she's almost dead. Okay, you need to calm down and find me something with an address. I can't help you without an address. Uh, okay, I'll try to look outside again. But open the you... door. Open up the door and look at the at the porch up on the What's porch. Open up the door. Look okay. on the porch. Give me those numbers off your porch. All right. The dispatcher then heard the girl's little sister in the background and aggressively asked about her. You said no one else is there. I hear someone in the back. Oh, that's my sister. Okay, how old is your sister? Okay, okay, I know her address now. How what? old is your sister? She's six. The girl was also able to read off the first few letters of the street name and get the address to the dispatcher. Um, um I know her address now. One nine three eight zero. What is the street? Um, it's, I can tell you um this, but it's you have to tell me the street. Okay, it's D L A. I don't know. It's what Glastonbury. Yes. Is and it I a need... house or is this a, a two-family flat? It's a house. Um. Finally, the dispatcher asked what was wrong with Monica and tried to understand what happened that evening. What is wrong with your mom? She got shot. Somebody shot her. Yes. Who shot your mom? I don't know who's going to Where's your mom at? She's downstairs in the basement. Who is the guy? I don't know. She was just some guy. Is she bleeding from where? Yes, yeah, she's bleeding from, I don't know, from her head or something. I think it's from her head. She's still breathing. Um, My dad is not. Your dad? Yeah, let me speak to your dad. No, he's dead. My mom is still breathing. So he, your mom and dad were shot? Yes. Hello, and I need an emergency, okay? Hello? It's unclear whether the dispatcher hung up here, but eventually authorities located the northwest Detroit home and arrived at the scene. When police arrived at the scene, they found Purcell Carson and Monica Botello with their mouths duct taped in the basement. Purcell was sadly pronounced dead at the scene from a single shot to the front of the head, execution style. Monica had also been shot once in the back of the head, but she was still alive. She was immediately rushed to the hospital, but devastatingly pronounced dead on arrival. Luckily, the eight-year-old and six-year-old sisters were unharmed and were taken straight to family members, where they were briefly interviewed. The children said that daddy's friends were sitting on the couch and an argument broke out between the two friends and their daddy. The girls were then taken to the bathroom by their mother and Purcell was duct taped in the basement. Their mum was then taken out of the bathroom to the basement and they then heard two gunshots from downstairs. The eight-year-old girl then called 911 from a cell phone. At the crime scene, they found the duct tape and cell phone as well as bullet-riddled sofa cushions indicating they had shot through these. They dusted the table for possible prints, as they knew they had all been sitting on the couch, but no clear prints were picked up. A major piece of evidence was found, however, in Purcell's jacket, which was still at the scene. Inside it, they found a prison discharge slip that belonged to a man called Derek Dennard Smith. Back at the police station, Sergeant Ernest Wilson the lead supervisor in the investigation, started working on the case. After looking up Derek Dennard Smith in the system, they saw that he had prior convictions for assault, armed robbery and kidnapping, and that he had been out of prison for six weeks. Later that evening, a witness from the neighborhood arrived on the scene with information. They took the witness back to the police station to be interviewed. The witness said that Purcell had arranged to buy a large quantity of painkillers to sell on the street from a man he had previously met in prison. The witness also mentioned that the man had always planned to rob Purcell. 
When asked to describe this man, the witness said he was light-skinned and had dreadlocks, which matched Derek Smith's description. Seems like uh, some guys came in to do a drug transaction involving the individual that Purcell is in prison with. Looks like he got a prison and is just doing dope robberies, claiming that he has dope for money. I think this may be our guy. The police next wanted to check with the young girls whether Derek Smith was indeed the man who had been in the house that night, so they went to talk with the children. The eight-year-old recounted what had happened the night before to a kid's talk forensic interviewer. She said, We went to our daddy's house. He's not really our daddy. He just acts like it. His friends came over. They was counting money and stuff. My daddy was just sitting back watching. Then he said, That's all the money I got. They told my mummy and us to go in the bathroom and lay down. She kissed us on the cheek and said, No matter what happens, I will always love you. Then they take them downstairs. Why would they do that if my mum didn't do nothing? Both the eight-year-old and the six-year-old were then shown a lineup of men, and they both successfully pointed out Derek Smith. The next step was to find Derek Smith and identify the second man involved. After going to Derek's last known address and not finding him there, the police held a press conference asking the public to help locate Derek Smith. We are acting the public's urgent assistance uh, in helping us locate a gentleman by the name of Derek Denard Smith. He is a career criminal. He has served prison terms uh, a number of times. I mean, we all got kids. You know, we've all felt it. And we're all anxious to get this guy in. They also decided to release the 911 call to show the public the kind of person Derek was and what they were dealing with. The recording was released with permission from the Botello's family, as they wanted to show the distress and agony Monica's young daughter experienced while making the call. Ten days later, investigators received crucial new information from two of Derek's acquaintances. They said that Derek had fled to California and provided the name of a person he might be staying with in Los Angeles. Marshals finally arrested Derek Smith on the 19th of March in Gardena, California. Sergeant Ernest Wilson traveled to LA in the hopes of interviewing him and getting more information, but Derek invoked his rights and his attorney advised him not to talk. Sergeant Ernest Wilson said that he ended their meeting by thanking Derek for not harming the children. Derek then looked up at him with a disturbed look and said that in their game, they don't do anything to kids. Two months after the murder, Derek was extradited back to Detroit, and he still refused to talk. Derek Smith was subsequently convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of torture. He was sentenced to concurrent sentences of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for the first-degree murder convictions and 60 to 90 years for the torture convictions. Six months after the murders occurred, Detroit Homicide located a second suspect named Devi Lauren Smith. Despite their similar surnames, they were not related. In his statement to the police, Devi admitted to being in the victim's house, but claimed that he did nothing to aid Derek, who he stated was solely responsible for binding, robbing, and killing the two victims. His defense was that Derek called him and asked him to come to Purcell's house to facilitate a drug deal. When Devi saw that Derek planned to rob Purcell, he escorted the children to the bathroom for their protection, and then left the premises. The prosecution relied on the eight-year-old's statements and testimony that Devi was armed with a gun, and forced them into the bathroom to discredit his version of events. She asserted that his conduct, at a minimum, constituted aiding and abetting Derek's crimes. Based on this evidence, the jury found Devi guilty of the offences, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 23 to 50 years for the torture, and a consecutive term of two years for the firearm convictions. After the 911 tape was released, the tone of the dispatcher drew criticism from some police officials and members of the public, who felt that the dispatcher was dismissive and aggressive with the young girl. 
Detroit's police chief Warren Evans said that the 911 dispatcher was disciplined following the call, but that she, in theory, didn't do anything wrong. The chief said, the dispatcher did everything right, but sometimes a little sensitivity is warranted. He explained that while the dispatcher acted appropriately and sent a car in a timely fashion, she should have shown more sensitivity towards the young girl during the call. The dispatcher's name wasn't released, nor was the specific disciplinary action she received. Detroit Police Chief Warren Evans mentioned that some 911 dispatchers in Detroit need attitude adjustments when dealing with frantic callers. He acknowledged that this might be due to spending many years on the job and dealing with thousands of calls a day, but he said that dispatchers could be more reassuring and consoling without compromising their professionalism. The dispatcher's tone on the call was definitely unprofessional in my opinion, but the eight-year-old girl's composure and how she handled the situation was incredible. She knew exactly what to do and was there protecting her little sister and trying to get her family help. All in all, this is a tragic case. Monica's children lost their mother and a father figure and witnessed a horrible scene that no one should ever witness. Though I agree, none of these deals should have been going on while children were in the house. Both Purcell and Monica did not deserve to lose their life so tragically. Not only did Monica's children lose a parent, but so did Purcell's son. Me and my son was extremely close. It's just not the same without him right now. And he was everything to me. He was just everything to me. He was the life of the family. Always joking, kidding around, playing too much. And he was a wonderful father. He wasn't just a father to his child, but he was a father to many others. He, he stepped up. As always, my heart goes out to everyone impacted by this heinous crime and rest in peace. Monica Botello and Purcell Carson.